Hey guys, it's Chase here with a recap video on the Splatoon 3 Direct that just aired yesterday. I thought it was super amazing, I'd give it like a 9.5 out of 10. If you guys want to see my live reaction to it, you can check that out in the description. Anyway, I wanted to make a video where I go over the main important topics that were brought up in this Direct. It was really early in the morning and not everyone was able to watch it, and even if you were able to watch it, you might have missed some stuff. I definitely didn't catch some things on my first time watching. Also, there are some extra things revealed that weren't shown in the direct, so we're going to cover those as well. Guys, if you like this type of video and want to see a bunch more Splatoon 3 content, please like the video and consider subscribing. There is going to be much more content from me on the way, you have no idea. Alright, let's get into it. So the first notable thing that they talked about was the new Squid Surge and Squid Roll techniques. The Squid Surge can be performed by charging while on a wall and then releasing. The squid roll can be performed by swimming in one direction, then immediately jumping back in the opposite direction. They confirm that these moves can repel ink for a short period of time while your character is glowing, making you somewhat invincible. We kind of already knew this, but we now have confirmation in video form. They then go into a segment about the stages in the game. We get a look at all the new stages that were revealed via Twitter, but they then show us a brand new stage that has never been seen before, called Hagglefish Market, which appears to be based on an outdoor market with vendors. Next, they tell us all about the returning stages from previous games. We already knew about Museum di Alfonsino, but what we didn't know about was Hammerhead Bridge, which has some lore behind it. The narrator says that Hammerhead Bridge is what connects Inkopolis to the Splatlands. Also, remember how in Splatoon 1, this map had like a lot of construction going on? Well, it's finally complete and as a result, this map looks much different now. A lot of the greats seem to be gone. Mahi Mahi Resort also returns from Splatoon 1 with its rising and lowering platforms gimmick. Four maps make a return from Splatoon 2, that being Inkblot Art Academy, Sturgeon Shipyard, Mako Mart, and Wahoo World. They then go on to say that more stages will be added later on through free updates, which is expected. Here, they confirm that Flounder Heights from Splatoon 1 will be making an appearance, and they also give us a look at a brand new Sand Palace stage. Next up, they talk about weapons, and they immediately confirm that every base weapon from previous games will be making a return. Again, we already knew this, but it's just nice to hear it in video form. A new weapon class was revealed, called the Splatana. They show one weapon from this class in action, called the Splatana Wiper. When you press ZR repeatedly, it will shoot out small projectiles. However, if you hold ZR, it'll charge, and you can perform an attack called the Charge Slash, which can be effective as a long-range attack. From what I gather, it appears that in order to one-shot somebody at full health, you'll need to perform a Charge Slash. We then move into the special weapons. New types are revealed, including the Tactic Cooler, which is used by an NZAP. When used, this deploys a little fridge that contains four cans. The narrator says that the cans give a variety of benefits, including momentarily increasing speed. As of now, this is the only benefit that we know of, but I imagine the others include ink efficiency perks as well. When you grab one of the cans, it does appear that you have a glowing aura around you, so I think it might be like ink armor and that people will know where you are when it's active, so you can't really shark. What's cool about the Tactic Cooler is that it comes in packs of four, so everyone on your team can grab one. What's not clear is if one person can take multiple and stack the effects, or can you only grab one maximum. We'll just have to wait and see. They then show the Wave Breaker, used by an E-Leader, which deploys a contraption that releases shock waves. Enemies can jump over these waves, but if they fail to do so, they'll take damage, and also have the location marked like a point sensor. The opponents here seem to die after 3 hits, so it seems that each individual wave does at least 35 damage. Also, this special really reminds me of this enemy from Super Mario Galaxy. Lastly, they reveal the Reef Slider, which is used by the Tetra Duelies. This special activates an inflatable shark that you can ride on at high speed. When the attack ends, it'll explode. What's unclear is whether or not you can choose when to detonate this thing, or if it's just the same amount of time every single time you use it. They then confirm some returning specials from Splatoon 2, being Tenta Missiles, Inkjet, Inkstorm, Ultra Stamp, and Booyah Bomb. They also confirm a few weapon kits, including the Splat Duelies, which has Suction Bomb and Crab Tank. Moving on, we get some info about the shops in the hub world. First, we get to see Ammo Knights with Sheldon. What's different this time around is that you don't buy weapons with money, but instead it uses a different type of currency, called Sheldon Licenses. These can be earned from leveling up and consistently using the same weapon. They also tease that if you exchange more Sheldon Licenses than normal, you can get access to weapons early. 
Also to note here, Gluga Duelies have Splash Roll and Booyah Bomb. They then show off some of the new clothing shops, which feature some new characters running them. One thing to note is that we get confirmation of a new clothing brand, Embers. A new gear perk is confirmed, called Intensify Action. According to the narrator, this ability increases the effectiveness of the Squid Roll and Squid Surge techniques. More information can be found from the Japanese website, which confirms that using Squid Roll continuously lowers your movement speed. It also says that the accuracy of your weapon will decrease shortly after the Squid Roll. Running enhanced action can make these hindrances less impactful. It will also lower the amount of charge time required to perform a Squid Surge. There's another new ability, called Sub Resistance Up, which is basically just Bomb Defense DX renamed. What's different though is that running this ability no longer minimizes damage against specials but it does reduce damage from Sprinkler and minimizes the effects of Toxic Mist. We're then shown Merch who's going through puberty, and we can do a few new things with him. Ability chunks are confirmed to be returning, and what's crazy is that you can now change the main ability on a piece of gear, not just the subs. Also note that Merch has gotten much nicer and mature with age. There's a new feature when selecting gear called Freshest Fits. Here, you can save up to 5 gear builds, letting you swap between loadouts extremely fast. In Splatoon 2, this required amiibo, so it's good to see that it's not locked behind a paywall this time. Next, we get more details on how the multiplayer lobby works in this game. Aside from Turf Wars, we have access to a new form of ranked battles, called Anarchy Battle. It seems that you can choose to play one game at a time, or you can do a series. Here, it says win 5 to triumph, lose 3 and you're out. They don't go into much detail on what this entails, but my question is whether or not you'll be with the same players for all of the games in the series. Note that if you choose Anarchy Battle Open, you can play it solo or with friends. What the Direct didn't tell you is that at launch, we're going back to the way Splatoon 2 handled ranks at launch. X rank won't exist, but instead, there will be 50 levels of S+. After a period of time, X battles will be added, and apparently, it will be available to anyone who is S plus 0 rank or higher. A great change is that you can select a region for these battles, so you can choose to participate in Japanese lobbies or North American lobbies. Private battles make a return, and an amazing feature will be added. You will be able to invite players to your room who aren't on your friends list via a keyword, according to the Japanese website. Unfortunately, this feature won't be available at launch, but it'll come in a future update. I'm just glad it's going to be there at all. We get to see all the modes, and sadly, no new ones as of now. Rainmaker seems to be overhauled as it now has checkpoints, similar to tower control. We then get to see a massively overhauled training room, and what's really cool about this is that you can warm up while waiting to queue into a lobby. We asked, and Nintendo answered. There's some weird piece of machinery to the right over here that wasn't mentioned in the direct, but thanks to the website, we have more info on this. Apparently, it can retaliate with enemy ink so you can practice defensive maneuvers. Hopefully the AI on it is smart so we can actually make use of it. Another new feature is ghosts, which are basically a way of showing what your current online friends are doing. If they're in a turf war, or have an anarchy or private lobby open, their ghost will show up here. You can talk to them and join right from this screen. Apparently, you can also start a turf war with friends and guarantee all of you be on the same team. You can also send invites to friends, which I assume takes advantage of the Switch's friend invite feature. Amazing! While waiting to find opponents, you can even see your friends screwing around in the training room, which I think is a really cool touch. The lobby features a new terminal which has a variety of features, including checking battle stats, changing your splash tag, and name. Most importantly, they added a new feature where you can view replays of your most recent 50 matches. In these replays, you can view the match from any player's perspective. You also have the ability to fast forward, jump to a later point in the match, and create highlight points. You can then upload your match for other players to view, via a code. Hmm, all this replay stuff seems kind of familiar. You now have access to a locker, which you can customize with your own decorations and can represent you in any way you like. You can also see the lockers of recent players that you've played with. It's not exactly apartments like many people hoped, but it is a customizable space that belongs to you. That's good enough for me. There's a brand new store called Hotlantis, which sells different items that you can put inside your locker. There are a lot of new customization features, such as splash tags, which you already knew about. But something we didn't know is that you can change the animation that your character performs after winning a battle. All these features can be purchased at Hotlantis through catalogs. The narrator says that new catalogs will be added to the game every three months over a two-year lifespan. 
They then introduce a weird new mode which seems to be a Tetris style card game? It seems cute, but I don't think this is going to be anything that people care about too much. There are over 150 cards to collect though, so some completionists might go crazy over that. As I predicted, we then get a Salmon Run segment. They show us some new boss Salmonids, but more importantly, we get introduced to a new type of enemy called a King Salmonid, this one being called Kohozuna. This massive creature will appear randomly at the end of Salmon Run matches, and it's a timed battle where you have to damage him enough to scare him off. You can apparently fire golden eggs at him which deal more damage. Also note that other Salmonids are still on the field as well, so this is definitely going to make for a hectic battle. What I really like is that a new Salmon Run mode, called Big Run, was revealed. It seems here that Salmonids will start invading the city, which means playing Salmon Run on actual battle stages. They did say that this would only happen every few months, which I think is really cool. Oh yeah, one more thing, Salmon Run is open 24-7 now. No more stupid wait periods between rotations, you can play whenever you want. Next, we get a little story mode teaser. Not too much is revealed, but what I find interesting is that the narrator says that this is the finale of the Splatastic Saga. I'm not sure what this means, so I'll leave that one up to you guys. There's a new photo mode, which is something that a lot of people wanted. This lets you take pictures in any outfit with any angle. You can also post these pictures in your locker, which is pretty cute. You can now do recon on any map, at any time. No more having to wait for a certain map to be in the rotation. They then talk about amiibos, and this part is kind of confusing, because it says that you can use the amiibos to swap outfits, but you can already do that even without amiibos. I'm assuming it just means that you can save one of your freshest fits to the amiibo so you can swap more quickly? I'm not sure. I'm also hoping that you can save other gear loadouts to amiibo that aren't in your fresh 5. As it was in Splatoon 2, you can get exclusive gear from Amiibo and take pictures with them. We also get a look at three brand new Amiibos coming for Splatoon 3, releasing this holiday season. They look pretty snazzy. We're then told about this game's update plans. As stated before, we'll get a new catalog with a variety of items and collectibles every three months, but they also say that new weapons will be added around the same time as the catalogs. So from what I gather, it seems that they're going to release weapons in batches rather than one at a time, but more spaced out. They then say that X Battle, as well as League Battle, will be coming in future updates. It would seem that X Battle is the new X rank, but let's hope they improve it. The wording with League Battle is very confusing because they made it seem like Anarchy Open replaced League Battle, but I guess it didn't? They do also say that they plan to introduce large scale paid DLC, which is great in my opinion. If we get something else like Octo Expansion, I'm all for it. After all that, the Direct finally concludes with the introduction of the new idols. We're introduced to Fry, Shiver, and my personal favorite, The Big Man. This trio is known as Deep Cut, and they're going to be the new Pearl and Marina for this game. For the first time, we have three idols, which is suitable for Splatoon 3. Deep Cut hosts the news, however, I'm extremely happy to say that we can finally skip the news. Okay, well, kind of. You can have the news play in the background while you do other things. But hey, I'll take it. They then announced Splatfest returning, which is a surprise to no one. But what is a surprise is that this time around, there will be three teams to choose from every Splatfest, rather than two like in the previous games. In Splatoon 3, Splatfest will be 48 hours. In the first 24 hours, players will participate in a normal 4v4 turf war, like it's always been. But in the latter half, we'll get to participate in a brand new mode called Tri-Color Turf War. For the first time, we have three teams competing on the field at the same time. Sadly, it's not 12 players like you would think, it's still 8. The current winning team from the previous day will start in the middle, and they have to outpaint the other two teams, which only have two players. In the center of the map, there's a new thing called the Ultra Signal. According to the Splatoon NA Twitter, this is a beacon that the two enemy teams try to secure. If they do, it will unleash the Sprinkler of Doom, which is basically just a giant sprinkler that assists the teams of two in painting the map. One last cool thing about these Splatfest matches is that it actually shows you a live percentage, so you can have more of an idea who's winning during the match. The Direct ended with one last announcement. As we had all hoped for, a test fire. Well, that's basically what it is. 
although they're not calling it that, it's going to be the same as what they did for Splatoon 2, a Splatfest world premiere. This will be a separate app that you can download on your Switch, and it will start on Saturday, August 27th from 9am to 9pm PST. This will be our one chance to try out Splatoon 3 before it launches, so don't miss it. The Splatfest theme is very simple, rock, paper, or scissors. I'm definitely going with Team Scissors, but let me know what you guys are going with. Oh boy, that was a lot of information. But we did it guys, we reached the end. Right? Well, uh, uh, no. There's more stuff that Nintendo has shared on the Splatoon 3 website that wasn't talked about in the Direct. Oh, I'm just gonna rapid fire through these, so listen closely. Here we go. If you've played Splatoon 2, you'll be able to transfer save data. You'll even get some rewards for doing so, including three gold Sheldon passes, which lets you buy any weapon right off the bat, regardless of level. We can play Tetras on day one, boys. You can also join Anarchy Battles right away, and you can start the game at a higher rank, depending on your rank from Splatoon 2. It will also try and match you against players with similar skill levels from Splatoon 2. A new chainsaw looking weapon can be seen in a Japanese screenshot. I'm assuming this is part of the Splatana weapon class. I'll bet you this thing has a pretty fast kill time. While waiting to queue in for Salmon Run, there's a special Salmon Run exclusive training room where you can shoot dummies and also practice egg throwing. What's really nice is that Nintendo made a specific note to tell us that main power up and bomb defense up DX will not be returning in Splatoon 3. They learn, guys. From this screenshot, we can make out a few more weapon kits. Heavy Splatling and Dually Squelchers have Wave Breaker. Hydra Splatling has Booyah Bomb. Splattershot Jr. has Big Bubbler. And Flames of Roller has Tenta Missiles. Your in game name will no longer be tied to your Nintendo Switch profile, as we can see with this screenshot. Do note that every player will have an ID, so even if you have the same in-game name as someone else, the ID will make you unique. Your name can't be changed whenever you want, as it says you'll have to wait a bit. Changing your name will also change the ID number. Your data, such as rank, level, and gear, is now saved to an online server. So if you lose your console or game, no worries. You will still have that previous save data and all of that gear you worked so hard for. Rank being saved to a server is also good news, as there can be less cheating that way. So, funny story. Remember how everyone was happy that Splashdown was gone? Well, I have some bad news for you. The good news though is that I'm pretty sure this is just a story mode exclusive thing, because if it was actually usable in multiplayer, I think they would have mentioned it along with the other returning Splatoon 2 specials. Splatfests now have a new sneak peek period before they actually begin. After you pick your team, you can earn conch shells, and these shells will actually be calculated at the end of the Splatfest, and it can contribute to the winning team. If you want to try out the Splatoon 3 Splatfest world premiere on August 27th, but you don't currently have Nintendo Switch Online, don't worry, because the demo actually comes with a free week trial. So now, everyone can play. Okay guys, that is the end of my Splatoon 3 Direct recap and analysis. I hope you all enjoyed. Let me know down below what you guys thought of the Direct, and again, let me know what Splatfest team you're picking. If you guys enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing, as I did work my butt off yesterday trying to get this video ready for today. But trust me, there's going to be way more videos about this Direct. This is only the beginning.